the Hamlin Pool near Shark Bay in Western Australia. This ecosystem bears the fruit of nearly three and a half billion years of evolutionary change. But cyanobacteria from ages past still blanket the rocks below the waterline. Floating in the open sea, they can cavities of gas, buoyancy devices, allowing them to rise and fall with changing light intensity. As photosynthesis occurs, they excrete bubbles of oxygen. Soon, the ancient waters brim with oxygen, but most of it would not yet make it into the atmosphere. Iron compounds, ferrous salts from the sea, combine with the oxygen to form ferric oxide, painting the ocean floor a thick, rusty red. Oxidized iron from the sea also colors the landscape of Pilbara. Almost everywhere else on the planet where cyanobacteria thrived, major iron deposits were formed. Billions of years ago, colonies of cyanobacteria swept across the oceans of the world. In time, all of the iron in the sea was oxidized. But cyanobacteria continued to release oxygen at astounding rates. Great environmental changes were on the horizon as oxygen gained a foothold in the atmosphere and the once volatile orange skies faded softly into blue. As the chemistry of Earth's atmosphere shifted, what happened to the single-cell bacteria that had lived on hydrogen sulfide? Their evolution is linked to the rise of more complex life forms. The sea, once awash in hydrogen sulfide, was now rich in oxygen, thanks to the highly adaptive cyanobacteria. But oxygen was a life-threatening poison to bacteria like these that had survived so long on hydrogen sulfide. The rising spherical bubble is full of oxygen. Once exposed to the gas, the bacteria weaken and eventually die. How did the ancient life forms overcome the oxygen crisis? Soft membrane bacteria adopted a run-for-your-life defense strategy, staying clear of the gas as much as possible. The bacteria with hard shells found ways to exploit their new situation. Plunging into the oxygen-rich environment, they were evolutionary pioneers. Delta del Ebro, Spain, lies due west of Barcelona on the Mediterranean Sea. Locals call it the bull's horns because of its shape. Sewage water from the river flows into this region, making it an ideal breeding ground for bacteria. Microorganisms from ancient times still thrive here. Blue-green cyanobacteria blanket the surface of this slimy landscape. Here on the delta, scientists dig for clues about how early microorganisms adjusted to the oxygen infusion in their environment. This is from a brick. See that? But it's completely colonized. 
by these bacteria. They just will grow on anything. They'll grow on volcanic rocks, whatever you give them. Biologist Dr. Lynn Margulis of the University of Massachusetts in Amherst says that bacteria are remarkably adaptive, unlike many creatures that came after them. You have to think of them as not being single. You have to think of them as being many, many kinds. And some of them will just die because we let the oxygen come in contact. But many of them, most of them, will just wait until the oxygen goes away. There's others that will use the oxygen, but low concentration. There's others that lose, use it at somewhat higher concentration. So they line up as to what they can handle. The samples that Dr. Margulis collects from the Delta appear to be mud, but they're actually living colonies of bacteria. This wedge of green mat is cyanobacteria. Below it, a thick colony of bacteria that feeds on hydrogen sulfide. Only an inch from the surface, ancient bacteria survive today. When animals go extinct, they're gone, they're finished. But when bacteria change, they keep the old ones and add the new ones. So there's no real loss at all. So these anaerobes are still the way they have been many years. A closer look at the Delta sample reveals something new. A thin pink layer separates the oxygen-producing tier of cyanobacteria above from the bacteria subsisting on hydrogen sulfide below. Observing this pink layer, Dr. Margulis discovered some bacteria that behave in a curious manner. This cylinder is a cyanobacterium exhaling oxygen. But instead of dying on exposure to the gas, the small surrounding bacteria advance toward it. Dr. Margulis believes that a similar phenomenon occurred in the ancient seas as oxygen waste became a key part of the life cycle. For a time, all life in the sea, including the cyanobacteria that produced it, was threatened by the infusion of oxygen. To survive and eventually evolve, the hard-shelled bacteria first developed enzymes to neutralize the damage caused when oxygen reacts with organic molecules. Soon, these survivor cells learned how to harness oxygen as an energy source dramatically increasing their activity level and becoming fierce aggressors. To survive, the soft membrane bacteria from the habitat rich in hydrogen sulfide united with other bacteria, enlarging their body in self-defense. As oxygen further penetrated the air and sea, two distinct organisms with specialized functions were developing. One became a living power plant. The other had an enormous data bank in its cell nucleus. Together, these simple life forms would transform the face of the Earth. Billions of years of evolutionary progress have led to a rich diversity of life across the globe today. All animals, including humans, share the same basic cell structure as the planet's first microorganisms. At the cell's core is the nucleus, an enormous data bank full of genetic information. 
Moving around the nucleus are small organs, mitochondria, in various shapes and sizes. Their job is to supply the cell with all the energy it needs and to help it breathe. The birth of this cell is one of life's first great adaptations, the merging of the ancient hard and soft-shelled bacteria. How could these once competitive organisms coexist as one life form? The University of Tennessee in Knoxville, where Dr. Quang Jian, a specialist in cell biology, inadvertently witnessed the beginnings of a cellular partnership while running an experiment. In 1969, Dr. Jian was studying the ecology of amoebas he had collected from various lakes around the country. One day, he discovered that most of the amoebas he was cultivating were dying, infected by highly toxic bacteria. Removing the dead amoebas one by one, he was surprised by what he found. One amoeba, infected like the others, had somehow managed to survive. Examining the single-celled animal, he was stunned to find live bacteria inside. Dr. Gion decided to try another experiment on the same amoeba, five years later. When he extracted the foreign bacteria from inside the amoeba, a strange thing happened. As soon as the bacteria were removed, the amoeba lost its energy. Initially threatened by the bacteria, a symbiosis had developed between the two. Separated from this cooperative relationship, they both died. The bacteria's dependence on amoeba. From the very beginning, we tried to culture these bacteria outside amoebae, but we have not been able to culture them. They grow only within amoeba, and so they are getting something from amoeba for their survival, and we are trying to uh, find that out. Now, in the meantime, we have uh, learned that uh, amoebae produce a, a few proteins that are used by bacteria. And so it's, it's a kind of exchange. The phenomenon Dr. Jian witnessed in his laboratory may have imitated evolutionary patterns in the early seas. Two billion years ago, two very different microbodies merged to create an entirely new organism. Its success would ultimately lead to the proliferation of new species across the globe. The cell is the foundation of all life. Without it, no living creature could eat or breathe or grow. Our very existence depends on it. Every animal cell requires the nucleus to transmit information from its genetic data bank to the mitochondria. And the mitochondria, in turn, to fuel the cell with energy. When these microbodies work together, a cell has the energy to respond to environmental pressures. Throughout history, creatures that cooperate ensure their future while building increasingly complex ecosystems. It took some two and a half billion years for life to evolve beyond primitive microorganisms. But when change came to the planet's oceans, it was dramatic. New creatures of every shape and design tried their luck in the game of survival. For millions of years, longer than the entire history of man, 
Only one of them ruled the deep. The success of this aggressive carnivore may have triggered the planet's first population explosion. The sea, a vast staging area for evolution. 10,000 new species, each more curious looking than the next, developed during this period. The better the design, the greater the chance of survival. Yet few of these creatures, including the once fearsome predator, would rise through the ages. Two billion years ago, only one tenacious life form thrived in our ancient seas. Today, life flourishes in every biosphere across the planet. We owe this abundance, the millions of plants and animals that grace the land, the sea, and the skies of planet Earth, to life's smallest unit, the single cell.